Well, thank you all for coming. I'm very glad to be here today. We have a long session, uh, but we're going to make up for it by being very boring. So, but, but they said they're going to lock the doors, and you can't leave. So you've made, your, you've, you've made your bed, now you have to lay in it. All right. Uh, this is the thing that says that all the stuff that I'm saying doesn't count. So we're going to go over some of the stuff that you guys have probably already seen from Larry's keynote on, on uh, Monday. Today's Tuesday, right, yesterday. Uh, I'll go through some of that quickly. I will highlight certain aspects that I think uh, that, I'm not gonna say he did a bad job, but <laughs> certain things I, I feel like need to be uh, reinforced. But we also have a lot of new content, so don't, don't, don't check out just yet. So for context, last year we had four regions, and lots of people told me that they couldn't use a cloud with only four regions, which I think is true. Now we have 16 regions, um, which may not seem like a lot, but it turns out is a very large investment to be able to build 12 regions in a year. But if you look forward to the end of next year, we're going to have 36 regions. And we're not just building those in easy to build locations, we're building them all over the world, we're building them in Asia, we're building them in Latin America, we're building them in Africa, a huge amount of investment for us. And, uh, Something that I don't really cover here, but I wanted to mention, is it's not just that we're building these regions, we're also building a ton of region-specific certifications. So like in, for example, just this week we announced that we have FedRAMP moderate available in our gov regions in the US. We're getting a variety of, of higher level of compliances. So it's not just the region availability, it's also the security and the compliance that goes with it. So one thing that I wanted to highlight about our overall strategy is that we've heard from our customers that they really need in-country disaster recovery. And that's why and you see on that map from before, we're putting two regions in every country wherever possible. Sometimes it doesn't quite make sense. Uh, maybe the country's too small or it, there's certain reasons for that. But in general, we're really focused on in-country disaster recovery because of the really the changes in the past, say, three to five years around data protection laws, privacy concerns, et cetera. That's what we hear from our customers and it's also what we hear from regulators and other government agencies. Another area I wanted to touch on is ecosystem and partnerships. Uh, you may have already heard we, we're launching a new version of our marketplace. I think in a very quick form, our marketplace V2 enables customers to try what they want, pay only for what they use, they can consume it all in a single unified bill, and we're integrating tons of partners. Uh, we, we started with 10 launch partners at this open world that you can just procure their software and it gets billed to you directly, and we're going to be adding many, many more every single month. You probably already heard me talk about this Microsoft partnership. You've heard Larry talk about it. Maybe you've heard your friends talk about it. Um, the thing to understand is that Oracle and Microsoft are working together to enable their joint customers to bring shared workloads to the cloud. We started this in Virginia, and it's also now available in London. We're bringing this to the US West, which is really important because our US customers are, are demanding DR, and I think you'll see this as a, uh, expanding around the world. The, the thing to really understand is that it, it, it has three factors. We work together at an identity level, which means that you can share your credentials and your identity posture across both clouds. We've worked together at the network connectivity level. What that means is, for example, in Virginia, the latency between Azure and the latency between the Oracle OCI is 1.2 milliseconds. For any of you that are familiar with the typical latency between different availability zones or the different availability domains in a region, they're as close together as honestly as our individual ADs are in Virginia. And then the third thing is we've worked together to make sure we have a shared support model. What that means is if you have a problem with your internet connectivity, if you have a problem with your shared identity system, you can call up Microsoft, you can call up us, doesn't matter, we understand it, we can fix it, and you're fully supported. Another big announcement is our uh, new partnership with VMware. So the thing to understand about this is we're really focused on enabling the most demanding customers to be able to move their most exacting workloads from on-prem into our cloud. To do that, our customers told us they need full administrative control. What we built is we built the fundamental bare metal capability you're all familiar with, and we're also adding pervasive, pervasive layer two virtualization that enables the actual VMware stack to run natively on top of our infrastructure. When you combine that, with a management service that we're deploying that makes it easy to deploy the service, upgrade it, patch it, et cetera. You can now, as a customer, take your VMware estate, 
You can burst it to the cloud. You can manage from uh, your cloud estate from on-prem, et cetera. It's very, very seamless. Uh, and that's exactly what our customers have been telling us they want. So just as a quick summary, because everyone likes a big pile of logos, the, the thing to understand here is that we're not just focused on any single vertical, right? We're going after different databases. We're going after different analytics and ML and H, uh, HPC offerings. Across the entire stack, we're working with as many partners as possible to make sure, they're certify, make sure their software works really well on top of Oracle Cloud infrastructure. It's certified, it's supported, and it's available in our marketplace, ideally as a bring your own license version and as a license included version. So this is something I'm personally very, very passionate about. It's truly elastic infrastructure. You know, you heard Larry yesterday talk about, hey, the whole promise of the generation one cloud was the idea that you can pay for what you use only when you use it. And we've, we've really split this into two big pieces, right? I think originally we talked a lot about elasticity, and then over time there's this new concept of serverless that came out. Well, the thing to understand is that I think in an ideal world everything would be serverless. I don't, most people don't ideally want to deal with servers. They'd like it all to be completely serverless. But it's not really possible for all, all applications. Sometimes you need the control that configuring servers gives you. When you actually look at what most of our competitors offer. The reality is that there are serverless offerings that have a lot of limitations, and then there are elastic offerings that in many ways are just not very elastic. So as an example, if you actually go to something like, say, RDS, and you spin up a four-core MySQL cluster, and you decide that you want to have an eight-core MySQL cluster, what you do is you push a button, and that's really nice, and then you get five to 10 minutes of downtime while it reconfigures your database. Now, that's better than doing it yourself and maybe taking hours of downtime, but it's not the same level of seamless experience that we provide with the autonomous database. More importantly, I want to talk to you about elasticity. So uh, the standard, kind of the gold standard in compute these days is you get these fixed shape uh, VMs, right? You pick the amount of memory and RAM, they, they're, they're packaged together. It feels a bit like, uh, like you're going to the store, uh, you know, and you're having to choose from small, medium, and large t-shirts, and you put one on and it never quite fits right. What we believe is that all of your clothes should be completely custom fitted. We think it should match exactly the needs that you have. And so what we're doing is we're launching a completely new way to think about compute and block storage. So what we believe is when you pick a compute instance, you should just pick the number of cores you want, you should pick the amount of memory that you want associated with that, and you should pay only for the stuff that you're using. In addition, you should be able to online resize that. If you want to add more cores, you just add them. If you want to take them away, you can take them away. If you want to increase your memory, you should be able to do that, all while your VM is still running. And that's what we're building. The same thing is true for storage. We don't believe that you should have to pick one, between one of five or six volume types up front, decide if you want it on a hard drive or if you want it on an SSD. Do you have to guess how many IOPS you need up front? We think that's a bad idea. Instead, what we believe is that you should be able to pick some storage that you want, and you should be able to have a very simple selection of the performance level. Now, the good thing is, after you do that, you can dynamically change your performance level. This is something that's very exciting and I'll actually show you a demonstration of in a minute. This is going to be available in a couple of months, but we've already built this technology. And not only can you scale your performance dynamically, you can actually, we're adding the ability to dynamically resize your volumes um, to scale them up automatically as well in terms of, in terms of capacity. So the reason I'm, I'm highlighting these uh, differences here is not to say that the old world wasn't good. What we're saying is it's not good enough. We think that customers really need this flexibility. They need this elasticity. And they need the ability to do all of, all of these flexible changes without incurring downtime. So I'll go through a few of these announcements today. Uh, cluster networking is generally available. It's the thing that underpins our overall HPC offering. Um, we have a 100 gig Rocky network and we're gonna be adding new HP, uh, HPC instances in the future as well as different uh, GPU instances. Today, we now support Microsoft SQL Server available on our marketplace. So we now have a certified and supported version of SQL Server that you can buy and run on top of OCI. As we talked about, we have our next generation of block storage. That's coming out in Q4 of this calendar year. 
And it means, and the cool thing is, so that you know, when we launch this, all of your existing block storage volumes will just convert to this. You're not gonna have to go and upgrade. So suddenly, you'll get a block storage volume, the one you have today, and you'll just get the ability to dynamically resize the performance. Same price. If you wanna lower your cost, you can slide the performance down, and if you wanna get higher performance, you can, you can slide that up as well. We're launching instance resize, which allows you to reconfigure which fault domain you're in, which instance family you're in, if you wanna switch, say, from an Intel CPU to an AMD CPU or back. Um, this is launching, like I said, by the, by the end of this year. Talked a bit already about these elastic instances. This is coming uh, in Q1 of 2020, so I think it'll actually be around February. And this will also be launching at the same time that we launch our new AMD-based instances. So available in, in uh, Q1 of 2020, we'll have our AMD ROM offering that'll have 128 cores, up to two terabytes of memory in a single server. And that'll also be available with our new VM offering of completely elastic instances. And of course, we'll have the next generation of Intel CPUs, both in an HPC form and in a standard form, that will be available next summer. And now, we're going to roll a demonstration that talks about uh, how Microsoft and uh, OCI work together as well as demonstrate some of our storage capabilities. Can you roll that? I will now show you a demo of several new exciting features we've recently launched. This demo is based on a fictional retail e-commerce company running a website that sells a variety of items. Their company has launched a Black Friday sale across their site and their total orders have spiked 4x in response to the deals. Before diving into the details of the new services, I'll give you a brief overview of the site architecture. The e-commerce site uses a multi-cloud architecture made possible by our partnership with Microsoft. We have services running on Oracle Cloud infrastructure combined with a few services in Azure. Notably, our new Gen 2 block storage is where we have stored our critical transaction information, which I'll talk about in more detail. We've logged into the Azure portal using multi-cloud single sign-on made of possible by integration between OCI and Azure Identity Services. You can see we have our app deployed, the front end of it, in Azure using Azure Web App. These front end components talk to a data store residing in OCI, which I'll now show you. We've seamlessly been logged into the OCI console using the same single sign-on identity credentials. The orders are coming into this data store running on a bare metal instance in Ashburn. We've also attached our new Gen 2 block storage volume to this instance. As the orders are coming into Acme's web store, we can see the orders being processed. Currently, the block storage system is configured to be optimized for price. Since this is a busy period for Acme, we want to process these orders much faster. We can simply go back to the OCI console and dynamically configure the volume performance. You can see we have gone from only 3,000 IOPS to 35,000 IOPS, a 12x increase in performance. We simply submit the request, and without any downtime or interruption to the orders, we've increased our performance. This seems simple, but on competitor clouds, this would require an outage and hours of copying data between different volume types. Going back to the portal where orders are being processed, we can see that the orders are now being processed 4x faster compared to the cost-optimized configuration. This is a simple demonstration that shows the real-world value of our new uh, block storage infrastructure, as well as our Microsoft Interconnect. Now, the thing I want to highlight here is because I think it's very valid. Some people might say, well, Clay, uh, it seems a little bit made up. Do you really think that increasing my block storage volume performance is going to have that big of a, a performance gain on my application? And this is where I tell you the beauty of this is that it doesn't matter. And here's why. Let's say that you increase your performance and your application doesn't get faster. Great. Turn the performance down and save a bunch of money. And if it turns out that increasing your block storage performance does make your application faster, you can decide if that's the right trade-off for you. Do you want to pay the money for the increased performance? None of that do you have to do a whole bunch of complicated work. That's the real value that the choices we're making around storage, and you'll have that exact same flexibility around compute as well. Those are the true deep innovations we're doing at Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Now, you've heard me talk for far too long. What I'm going to do is have Garov from Reliance come up, and he's going to share a bunch of interesting stuff that they're doing using our cloud, as well as a lot about their very interesting business. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Uh, myself, Gaurav Dugal. I represent a technology and innovation division of Reliance Geo. 
to tell you about Reliance Jio, it's the second largest operator in the world. Uh, it is the largest operator in India. We handle around 350 plus million customers, which is I think 10 to 12 percent more than the total US population. We, uh, on our network, people consume around 11 GB of data per month, which makes us the largest data consumer of the world as a country. Uh, we operate various apps, live TV, gamification, news, video conferencing, etc. My team works on various applications. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few. The first application is a patented HelloGeo chatbot, which has handled around 300 million utterances over a year with 25 plus domain with a near accuracy of 95 to 97%. It works in multiple Indian languages. If you open your MyGeo app and you talk to it about, your, uh, about playing a movie, about checking your balances, about uh, checking your data usage, you can get it. The second application is engagement app, which is a highly awarded uh, multiplayer gamification with live sports and TV shows. Uh, this has 100 million monthly user base. And uh, last, so there is, a, there is a series called Indian Premier League. Uh, we are a cricket uh, fascinated nation. Uh, so we, uh, we, we held this competition and we had around 155 million users interacting with our app. We hold various brand engagements inside this Engage platform. The third one is our video conferencing app, which is GeoMeet, where people can conference from any device, anytime, anywhere. It's an end-to-end -end unified collaboration platform with chat, audio, video, and web interfaces. Few machine learning initiatives which my team works on is speech-to-text. We have around 100 million trainable parameters that gets optimized per iteration. The benefits of using Oracle is 2 to 2.5x because of NIC connected clustered GPUs, which is not, uh, high, which is not available in another uh, cloud providers. There's another application we have is text-to-speech. These are all for Indian languages. The speech-to-text, text-to-speech text is available for English languages by other cloud providers, but uh, for Indian languages, uh, they barely serve us. So we had to build it ground up for us. For text-to-speech, we have, again, hundreds of millions of parameters which, uh, which are needed for generating voice map for the speakers. Again, we get around 50% faster opt optimization because of block storage, which gets us 10x more IOPS compared to other providers. The last is na natural language processing, which is used in HelloGeo chatbot. Uh, we have multiple layers of bidirectional LSTM and dense layers with hundreds and thousands of parameters to train. Uh, here also we get faster training, faster scaling for our video bots. These are a few of the stats for our GeoEngage application. Uh, apart from all these stats, uh, these are great. We have won Mobile World Congress uh, recognition last year for our application. This is a video bot application, which is world's first AI-based video call platform. Uh, again, it, it had got uh, 15 plus awards. Uh, we handled around 50 million utterances with 10 plus bots last year which is 90% of accuracy. We handle a peak of 10 million uh, DAUs, daily active users, during the launch. And uh, it runs pro on proprietary platform, which is Spark ML, containerized with Docker and Kubernetes, and uses open source for real-time monitoring and garbage detection. So we launched a GeoPhone, uh, which is first world's first 4G feature phone. Uh, however, it didn't have a speech interface. So we wanted people to have hands-free operation. This is the architecture for us to build speech-to-text for GeoPhone. It uses a cluster of two nodes with eight GPUs, each connected with 50 GBPS NIC. Like I earlier said, this is only possible in Oracle. It's not provided by other providers. Uh, it, it reduces our uh, training time heavily. This is one of the applications we launched in Engage, where we were giving a GB of free data for anybody who's clicking a wrapper of a Cadbury dairy milk uh, after eating it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it became so viral that uh, in 2025 days, we had around 100, 100 plus million notification. So we're doing artificial intelligence at scale. Uh, so the focus is to derive, define, and develop, deploy AI models at hyperscale. So we are building it for vertically targeted products on our proprietary deep learning innovations. So OCI 
what are the benefits of OCI? So we have got 10x cost reduction uh, compared to other providers. They have highly predictable charges. There's no hidden charge. There's minimal charge on network throughput compared to other providers. There's DDoS prevention is built in and OCI network is for free. The customer excellence team is great. The wellness team will send some guy for an organization of our size to sit with us, help us transfer workload from other providers to their provider. The performance on block storage is exemplary and we use a lot of NoSQL, Redis, and all, all the databases. Uh, for us, uh, it has helped a lot. The GPU with NIC cards are great. They have persistent NVMe protected data and uh, that is 1000x better than the other providers. I think that's it from my, my side. Thank you, Gaurav, that was great. So, uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about cloud security, as well as go into uh, some interesting stuff around our cloud native portfolio. What I can say is that I don't think anyone as of right now has really figured out how to make security simple in the cloud. That's true for us, that's true for our competitors. What I do believe though, is that it can be made significantly simpler. And so what I'm going to be telling you is about two really strong ideas that you'll see us deliver on over the next year. But it's important to understand that the ideas are the important part and the services that will layer into them. But it's really about a different philosophy that we're focused on with our overall security strategy. The first one is that we believe there should be a way that you can actually configure things so that you cannot have security be disabled. And we also believe that there should be a way that your system can behave in a completely automated or autonomous fashion and take actions for you when there are security issues. So, to solve that problem, we made a fancy picture, which is a good excuse for not having to build a product. Uh, so if I'm back here next year with a fancy picture about this, you should all throw tomatoes or something at me. Uh, but it's, I really wanted to communicate this to you very early. So I'll go into the details of each of these pieces, one of which is already uh, live today, uh, and the other two of which are coming very soon. So we have this new concept called Oracle Cloud Guard. What it is, is think of it as a system that takes in all the different data sources from the cloud. It takes in your audit logs, it takes in your network logs, it takes in your user actions. It then analyzes that behavior for anomalies. It then surfaces those anomalies to a decision rule engine. You can think of this as a configurable system, but the, the key here is how we're going to make this system very easy to configure. We automatically categorize threats into different threat levels, and we make it very easy for you to decide basic actions that you want to have happen when those threats occur. So as, uh, as a very concrete example, let's say that you have a user that normally logs in from certain IP addresses. Well, suddenly they start logging in from a different location. We can flag that, and then we can say that's a certain threat level, and then you can configure, do you want us to completely stop that? We can revoke the user's credentials. Do you want us to just notify you about it? Or perhaps you would like us to increase the security level for that customer, for that user, and now they need to use two-factor authentication when they normally wouldn't. And on its own, this idea is not particularly novel, right? You're all used to some of this kind of behavior when you use a bank website or maybe your, your email system, et cetera. The thing that we're saying, though, is that we're going to build that into every single layer of our cloud, whether it be the networking layer, the auditing system, the user permissions management system, the OS management service, every layer is going to be plugged into the system. And we're not just going to be analyzing your configurations and alerting you after the fact, you're going to be able to get all of that data, configure simple rules, and have the system actively control your security posture. And the reason this is so important is that humans just cannot react fast enough. And humans are not smart enough to twizzle 5,000 separate knobs. If you give that to everybody, we believe there's just no way to be actually secure. Now, with that alone, I think it's a pretty cool idea, but it's not enough, because that's fundamentally a reactive policy. To use that, you have to wait for something bad to happen, whether it's a misconfiguration or it's a bad user activity, and then you're trying to stop it. What we're also doing is we're creating this concept of a maximum security zone. And in many ways, this is novel, and in some ways, it's not so much. You can think of this as an extension of our compartment concept on steroids. What we're saying is that when you place your resources in a maximum security zone, security features are no longer optional. 100% of the maximum security features are always enabled. And when we enable new security features at any layer of the stack, they, 
we have an upgrade path so that your, the, your resources that are in that maximum security zone automatically receive those. So here's some kind of interesting examples, and this is not all done yet, but imagine if your object storage bucket only accepted data that was encrypted, and if you tried to upload unencrypted data, it gave you an error. What if your object storage bucket couldn't be private? What if you couldn't put it directly on the internet? What if data extraction, if we monitor your data exfil rates, and when you did, it, there's a hard limit on sensitive data, and it couldn't be extracted at a rate faster than a certain level? Those are the things that we implement, and they're the things that only a cloud provider can do because it has to work at every layer of the stack. It has to be built deep into the actual infrastructure as well as all those layers on top. You probably heard Larry talk yesterday about the, the, the sad state of OS security and how we think we can do a much better job across the industry. Well, OS security in general is complicated. You have all these packages, packages have security issues, and then you have to keep inventory management of it and then make sure everything gets patched. Instead, what we believe is that your, your operating system should be autonomous. It should actually keep track of itself. You should have a centralized management service, which we're calling our OS management service, that keeps track of these things. And the operating system should automatically be patched. When you do this, you don't then have to worry about, hey, was that CVE already fixed? You know it's automatically fixed. So the combination of these three ideas, the Oracle Cloud Guard, the Oracle Maximum Security Zone, combined with the power of autonomous Linux, we believe is going to be very, very powerful for creating really the most secure cloud available anywhere. To back that up, I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of the actual individual security announcements uh, that are coming out. So, uh, as Larry said, we now have a completely dedicated version of autonomous database, which means you're not sharing any infrastructure components when you run your autonomous database on top of that. He also talked about Oracle DataSafe yesterday, which really enables uh, the easy ability to analyze your Oracle database security posture, control it, as well as uh, make it very easy to make sure that you can create test databases that have uh, PII already masked, et cetera. We launched, uh, which is available now, our dedicated VM host, which gives you all the flexibility of VMs, uh, but with the, uh, with the added security that bare metal offerings give you. Uh, the other thing to understand here is that it's very, very seamless to set these up. You mostly just say, hey, I want this stuff to be launched on a dedicated host. Your VMs get placed there automatically, and you just pay for the underlying host that you're using. What will be available by the end of the year is the OS management service that also acts as a part of this autonomous Linux story. This keeps track of more than just Oracle Linux. It keeps track of multiple OSs. Right now, we're only focusing on Linux, but we'll actually have Windows support coming very soon and enables case splice and, and uh, real-time patching for uh, multiple Linux OSs, not just Oracle Linux. This is gonna be a very powerful service that many of our customers wanna use. So coming out in the very beginning of 2020 is our unified logging service. This is going to bring together all of the important information you get out of our uh, audit systems. It lets customers upload completely custom logs, as well as do analytics and searching capability on top. And this is also where we're going to add our security and incident event management functionality into our logging service as well. We're launching a new secrets management service that'll be available in the beginning of 2020. Uh, this is built on top of our HSM-backed key management service. And really, I always get confused about the difference between keys and secrets. And secrets are the things that uh, you need to log into places. You kind of need them back as plain text. Uh, but uh, and so, you know, in an ideal world, you would have no secrets. You just have keys stored in a KMS, but then we live in the real world where you need some secrets. I know I have my own secrets, um, and we need somewhere to put them, and so you should put them in a secret management service. Come on, this guy's, we got a, this is more, it's a long talk. <laughs> These are, that's the best I've got, okay? I don't have, I'm not a comedian. So we have a lot of enhancements for our key management service as well. Uh, we're introducing a virtual vault which is a very low cost version of our dedicated HSM. So today, the K KMS option we have gives each customer a dedicated HSM behind the scenes. We're offering a virtual vault where customers can share that. And the reason we're doing this is that we believe that every single customer should have access to our KMS. You shouldn't have to pay any money, and we'll actually be introducing this at a very, very low price, also known as free, such that you can at least get your one virtual vault that enables you uh, to, to integrate with all of our services with your own user-controlled keys without having to pay money. We have some important web application firewall enhancements. So there's some interesting stuff that we're happening around, uh, that's happening around our, our ability to propagate and protect uh, 
against issues that are happening all over the world. I think more importantly, uh, it's more important that we had this, this out of the box migration of open source mod security rules. A lot of our customers have been telling us it's very important to them. And then a few uh, individual enhancements in our overall network security. So we just recently launched granular network security lists. I, I struggle saying this is a feature. It's almost more like a, an embarrassment that we didn't have this before. Uh, but now you can address at the individual VNIC level your security list rather than having to address them at the entire subnet level. We have private endpoints, which is going to enable very flexible adaptations. This is important for our internal services, but it's also important for our marketplace customers where as a third party, you can now attach to someone's virtual network. Obviously, they have to grant the access. It makes it very easy for you to build a service that can attach your endpoint into someone's virtual network without having to integrate over the public internet. And then, of course, we also want to add IPsec encryption to our Fast Connect offering. So that's a bit about our security enhancements. Now I'm going to talk about some of our cloud native services. And then, of course, we'll have another amazing demo where someone does stuff and I talk. What is our position on cloud native? Well, you know, cloud native is an amorphous term. It's not very well defined. But one thing we do believe is that when people are building cloud native apps, they really care about having uh, openness and the ability to run their application in the cloud, as well as having a nice development platform on-prem, and also being able to take their application from one cloud provider to the other. To do that, here's a nice graphic that kind of shows the dedication that we have at Oracle to that openness. So uh, when you look at, say, for example, take our serverless offering, right? We have our function service that's now launched. But we didn't just launch a function service. We also created an open source project that enables customers to run those functions on a different cloud provider. Or more commonly, it also allows you to run those functions on premise, to run them on top of Kubernetes yourself, or to run them on your laptop. For example, with our orchestration service, we have a resource manager. Instead of building our own configuration management language, we chose to partner with Terraform to use the same standard syntax everyone's already using for multi-cloud deployments. And we built a service that enables the easy administration and access and control and management of that in our, in our cloud. So here's an amazing architecture diagram where you stack boxes on top of each other. Uh, the, the main thing to understand is that all of these things we put on this box are things that we either have available today or that will be available in the next three quarters. So I'll go into more details about each. But the, really, you know, for, if you were to talk to me you know, a couple of years ago, we didn't have a lot of these basic building blocks. What we've been doing within OCI is we've been aggressively building these services to make it possible for customers not only to build, say, their very complicated relational database workloads or their big data workloads or their HPC workloads, but they also, how can I build the next generation of really interesting workloads? And they're built on top of these services. So, we have some interesting uh, enhancements to our notification service. Most importantly here, we have HTTPS webhook integration as well as automatic integration with your own uh, pre-built uh, ticketing tools with things like Jira and Slack, et cetera. That's because most people use notifications to notify themselves and they would like that to be, I don't know, in one of the tools they use rather than, hey, you got an email, there's a problem. We're announcing our API gateway. This is available by the end of this year. You can think of this, there's many different ways to use the API gateway, but most commonly it's, hey, I have some functions, I want to expose those to the internet, I don't want to have to write my own service from scratch, can I just put your API gateway in front of that? The answer to that is, well, yes, of course you can. You can also use our API gateway to front your own application, whether it's written on top of VMs or containers or however you want to do it, our API gateway supports all those use cases. We have some enhancements to our function service. Uh, most notably, it's more integrations, uh, including integrations with our Oracle Integration Cloud, which is an extension platform for our software as a service. That makes it very easy when you, when you consume our SaaS products to be able to extend that using functions as well. We have a cloud shell coming out very early in 2020. Uh, not particularly novel, but you know, if you, when you log into the OCI console, wouldn't it be nice if you could just get a terminal that had all of the tools pre-installed, you had some built-in storage that would keep your scripts around, you can use it as an operational tool, or you can use it to just try out you know, a tutorial online. Great, we built that, and it'll be available in the beginning of 2020. We have a really interesting service. Oracle has a large uh, portfolio of application performance monitoring tools, but we haven't done the best job of integrating them fully into our cloud platform. We're doing that, that'll be available in Q2 of 2020. 
Uh, and the cool part is this, this is very easy to instrument, right? You just deploy it alongside your different stacks. You can use it in the cloud. It also supports APM uh, functionality with your on-prem applications as well. And now we're gonna take a minute and we'll show a demonstration that highlights security and some of our cloud native features. We will now demonstrate pre-configured security functionality offered by OCI to easily protect your web applications and automatically engage your operations teams to threats. We have an internet-facing retail web application built on Oracle Kubernetes Engine. OKE makes it easy for customers to reliably build, deploy, and manage cloud-native microservices. We'll now select an item, enter the required information, and place the order. We've received an application error message. The error message is displaying personally identifiable information about shoppers and other transaction details. This application is not following security best practices and it's also leaking internal architectural details. A curious attacker can easily use this method to get access to sensitive data. We'll use the OCI web application firewall to protect this application and prevent this type of information leakage. OCI WAF is a security cloud service that enforces security best practices and protects your application. We'll go into the OCI console and deploy WAF in front of this web app. Provide the domain name, IP address of the app, and select all the pre-configured rules that apply to web applications. And then we deploy it. Once that's done, our application is instantly more secure from hundreds of vulnerabilities such as cross-site scripting, PII leakage such as credit card and social security numbers, and much more. What we'll do now is we'll try the same operation as before and see if Oracle WAF prevents accidental data exposure. As you can see, instead of the security leak, we get a 403 forbidden error message. In addition to the above, OCI WAF has also sent the security violation metric to the OCI monitoring service. And I have an alarm set up to notify me and my team in the face of such web application firewall events. This notification has arrived in near real time you can see those alerts coming up on the top right, and it lets you know that something has happened bad and you should go take, in, uh, take action to investigate it. And with that, I'm going to bring up Diego from Booster Fuels, who's gonna tell you that all these things I just said about cloud native are not complete lies. <laughs> Thank you, Clay. Good afternoon. I am Diego Neto, co-founder and CTO of Booster Fuels where we are reinventing the way energy is being delivered. We're a gas station on wheels. And if you don't mind, raise your hand if you've heard of Booster Fuels before today. Okay, all right, for my marketer in the audience, that was about 50%. <laughs> We're working on it. So what makes this interesting? Booster uses OCI. Specifically, we were early adopters, being a cloud native company born four and a half years ago. We went straight to containers in 2016 and then realized the need for orchestration. We did not want to do orchestration manually, but we did in the early days and we realized that in order to provide value to our business, we needed to focus on pumping gas, not scaling our cloud. So when it came time to switch over to a managed solution, we gave OKE a shot and we have been very happy with it. Why? Clay touched on it, but the the desire to have more openness inside of the cloud native uh, land, I think is a really, really compelling argument. And uh, Functions is doing it really well. So why, why do we need to be cloud native? Because this is really hard. <laughs> Delivering gas is very difficult. We even created a bunch of slides with boxes and called it an operating system so you can see how hard it is. <laughs> But the truth is we're not just moving electrons around on the internet. We are taking physical atoms and putting it into your vehicle. And so we needed the right partner so that we could focus on providing value to our customers. Our customers love us. We have people that have not gone to a gas station in over three years. So for some of our corporate campuses that uh, desire to offer the, this service as a perk, they'll even subsidize a portion of the price per gallon on a specific day and effectively for less than the price of a bubbly drink per employee per month, you're getting a real tangible perk that has meaningful impact on people's lives. They can avoid going to the gas station, and pick up their kids from daycare sooner. Uh, they can, re there's no more stress or anxiety about waiting in lines. So it's a very tangible perk. There's only so many yoga classes you can take in a month. We also are focusing on providing value to our fleets. Our customers that operate large fleets 
on average, we're saving them about $1,500 per vehicle per year in labor and fraud and wear and tear on their vehicle. We're also providing value to the planet. I know it might be a bit contrarian to be here in Silicon Valley listening to me talk about selling gasoline through an app using containers, but, but we've been able to do it. With our truck, we've been able to shorten the supply chain dramatically enough to reduce emissions throughout the entire cycle. So I'm proud to say that up to date, we have, did, we have stopped 2.4 million pounds of carbon dioxide being emitted through the supply chain of energy. Before we go to uh, where we want to go next, there was a video I wanted to queue up and play that shows how the system works. Can we pull that up? I saw a cute little purple truck driving on the highway. I was very curious about it. And when I found out what they do, which is bring the gas station to people, I just decided I can do that too. Technology is a very vital role in what I do. As a customer, you can just open up your phone, open up the app, order gas by dropping a pin, and the technology that we use allows me to then see that pin. Once I'm done giving that person a boost, then everybody's happy. The technology in the trucks allows me to cut down the number of things that I need to do manually in the fueling process, which helps me focus on the things I want to focus on. Sustainability, what it means to me is doing my part on the planet. Our whole fleet is carbon neutral, and so every boost that I do saves 1.4 pounds of CO2. When I am doing my boost every day, I feel valuable to the planet. And I feel wonderful knowing that I'm giving time back to Booster customers because I have a son and I know what it's like to miss your family and me giving you a boost is helping with that. My name is Janae Spain and I'm a service professional at Booster Fuels. Thank you. As Janae pointed out, delivering value to our customers safely is top of mind for us. So. We want to spend as much time as we can focusing on that and not on scaling our cloud. So I can proudly say that we've been able to get to where we are today at the scale that Booster is operating at with just one DevOps engineer and 10% of my time. And so we want to keep it that way. We want to keep our engineers focused on delivering value to our customers and to make our service professionals' jobs more efficient so that they can worry about just pumping gas safely. So you saw the IoT platform briefly in that video. That allows us to automate a lot of the previously manual parts of the fueling process. Where we go next is serverless. So right now we're working on operations research and we wanna take our workloads that are gonna be running all of our fancy algorithms that tell our trucks where to go next. We wanna run them entirely serverless so that we don't have to worry about expanding our Kubernetes cluster because we really don't know precisely what the demand's gonna be and we don't want to incur that overhead. So every boost matters is a core principle at our company and we really try to live it. And in deciding who to partner with to cover our cloud needs, this was a value that I also saw present in Oracle and in the people in, part of, in the OCI organization. So thank you for your time. Well, I, I wish our color scheme was as cool as yours. We're, we tried, but we still didn't get as, as good as purple. We're not black and red anymore. We are something, redwood. It looks like trees. All right, I have, I have one more section to go through. I wanna talk about our overall data platform, have another demonstration, uh, and then we have some very exciting things to hear from uh, some of our partners and other customers at Oracle. So sometimes I find it helpful when I have to create these slides, I take a step back and I look at our overall portfolio and I'm surprised by the, where we've actually gotten to and where we've, where we've achieved in the past few years. Specifically, when you look at uh, the breadth and the depth of our offering, say when you look at our ingestion pipeline, the, the flexibility we have in our overall structured data stores, the flexibility we have from our analytics engines, um, where we're going to be in the next, say, six to nine months is an incredibly comprehensive data platform all up. And I'll talk to you about some of those announcements uh, to right now. So we launched a streaming service about a year ago. 
And we told lots of people that our plan was we were going to make it Kafka compatible. And then either nobody questioned it or they just assumed I was lying. And, but it turns out that we actually are making it Kafka compatible. And we're now actually in a limited availability release today, and it'll be out by the end of this year. And really the idea is we have a, a complete web interface that you can use for our streaming service. But you can now attach our same multi-tenant, large-scale streaming service directly to your virtual network. You attach it on a private endpoint. It speaks Kafka. You just change the configuration of your Kafka client, and you just use the service. I'm very excited about that. It's a huge amount of investment we've made, a lot of it hard engineering work, to really you see the commitment we have around giving our customers the choice and the flexibility and the openness such that you can use our service or you can use Kafka, but we'll, we'll take care of the operations for you. There's a new big data service we have coming out. This is a Cloudera compatible uh, Hadoop service. It'll be out by the end of this year. And really it's about um, fully integrated into OCI. How do we have a really first class Hadoop experience that enables customers to migrate from typically their Cloudera or Hortonworks distribution on-prem into our cloud. We have a very exciting new data flow service. This is our serverless Spark service. It'll be coming out in uh, the very first quarter of next year. Uh, I actually have some, some, uh, a demo that touches on this, but doesn't highlight it very much. This is very exciting. You take your Apache Spark jobs, you submit them. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to run a Spark cluster. We run all of that for you behind the scenes. You can store all of your data in Object Store. It processes it, get the results stored back in Object Store. It's very, very exciting service uh, that actually very complements some of our other services. Uh, our data catalog service. So we're now all taking all this data, we're shoving it into the cloud. We have log files here, we have structured data, we have unstructured data. How do you keep track of it all? As you make derivations of this data, what do you know the lineage of that data? Where did it come from? What, what is PII, what's not? Well, we now have a new data catalog service that allows you to uh, record this information, but it also does discovery for you. So if instead you're like me, and you have a giant room full of random stuff and you don't know what it is, you can think of the data catalog as this amazing person who goes in, looks in your room, figures out all the stuff you have, and then sorts it into where it's supposed to go. So it, it's both for upfront you know, curation as well as after the fact discovery. We have a very interesting data science service. We acquired a company a while ago called datascience.com and we've now fully integrated their data science portfolio into our uh, Oracle Cloud infrastructure. I have a demo that will showcase some of this data science functionality. This new service will be available in Q1 of 2020. We have a database migration service that's coming out very soon. Uh, this is built on top of our world leading Golden Gate and data integrator technology. Think of this as you attach this to your network. It can do online migration of databases from on-premise into the cloud, or you can move uh, different from different sources to other destinations. You can go from uh, sources that aren't Oracle to Oracle. You can go from Oracle to other, other destinations. It's a very exciting service. It'll be available in Q1 of 2020. We have a data integration service. So it turns out that people, instead of just migrating their databases, sometimes they want to do transformations as well. We used to call this stuff ETL, but that's now out of style and we use the, the word data integration instead. Uh, this is a service that makes it very simple for you to do, whether it's batch, batch moves or integration between you know, your OLTP database and you wanna extract some of those tables into your uh, data warehouse, et cetera. This is a service that manages all that for you and operates that in your completely private virtual network. We have an Oracle MySQL service that's coming out in Q2 of 2020. This is going to have all of the expected features you would, you would find, you know, an HA availability scale up, high availability, scale up, scale down, uh, scale out, et cetera. It's very exciting. And I think even more exciting is this Oracle MySQL Analytics service, which is a new service that attaches to that Oracle uh, MySQL service and provides incredible query capability by uh, a fully integrated in-memory cluster analytics engine that goes right beside it. And what we're finding is that this often offers up to 100x performance improvement for analytics type workloads uh, compared to the standard uh, MySQL engine. And now we're gonna roll a data platform demo. This scenario is the same retailer we saw before, top shelf. Credit card fraud is gro a growing concern for them and they want to prevent fraud at checkout time before they've shipped any products. Their retail website is already running an OCI. They are taking advantage of the Oracle Cloud data platform services to use machine learning to infer fraud in real time. This allows them to prompt for more validation and prevent fraud from happening. Behind, behind the scenes, here is what they have deployed. An Oracle autonomous database contains transaction data, customer account information, and a history of previous fraudulent transactions. 
The data flow service runs a Spark application that extracts this information, creates new insights, and stores it in object storage. The data science service uses this data to train a machine learning model. The model is then deployed as a function with a REST API endpoint. The retail web application calls this function for every transaction in real time. Based on the response from the function, the web application may put the transaction on hold or prompt for further authentication. Let's look at the data science service to see some of the steps involved in building and deploying the machine learning model. We have a notebook session that uses the Jupyter Lab interface familiar to data scientists. Data science libraries are preloaded in this environment so that data scientists can build and manage models with a few lines of Python code. Data stored in object storage by the data flow service is brought in. On the left, we see the transaction specific data that comes in from the web application, such as the geolocation of the customer when the transaction occurred. On the right, we see the data that comes from the customer account and transaction history, such as the typical geolocations associated with that customer and the average transaction amount. In the last column, we see the fraud labels that show whether past transactions were fraudulent. We need this so we can train the model. We select an auto ML model that comes from Oracle's Advanced Data Science SDK from Oracle Labs. A variety of open source models are also available to use. We run the model with the training data set and evaluate the effectiveness of the model across many dimensions. Once we've decided the model is sufficient, we save it to the model catalog and then deploy it to OCI functions. This function can be called for every transaction to get a fraud assessment. The nice thing about deploying the model as a function is that the customer pays only for the time when the function runs. So now we go ahead and go through our checkout steps again. Behind the scenes, the function is called and the model returns a result. In this case, the transaction is put on hold because the model determined that this is potentially fraudulent. The customer is asked to contact customer support to further validate the transaction. Now, I know that was a very quick demo and I only highlighted the data science part and the functions part. But the thing I want you to understand is that these are real, actual use cases that customers are doing on our platform today. Even ourselves are doing this. Autonomous database is there, we pull the data in, we process it, we train models, and we deploy it. So going back to what I talked about in the very beginning, we have an extremely comprehensive data platform. Yes, these services are coming out over the next couple of quarters. As you see them, I think it's gonna be, you're gonna be incredibly impressed with the overall quality that our data platform provides. So last the thing that I'll talk about is our always free cloud services. You probably already heard about this. You saw some people taking pictures of other keynote slides. The, uh, I'll show it to you again, don't, don't worry. Um, the thing to understand here is that not only are we launching this always free trial, and we're continuing to our $300 of free credits for the first 30 days, we're also giving, we're also launching some new very interesting shapes. So now you get a couple of autonomous databases. We have a scaled down compute offering. Uh, we're giving a free load balancer, et cetera. The idea behind this is that with this set of technology for free forever, you can build real applications, very interesting sets of applications on top of the Oracle Cloud. We're very excited about this. It really is for everybody. We're doing this, we're giving this away to developers in schools, we're giving it away to to everybody out there who wants it, you just do our normal sign-up process and you get these free forever. There's an image, which apparently if you take a picture of that, then you get a link. Turns out links are hard and pictures are easier. I didn't, I'm a little bit out of date. Now, I would like to bring up Dinesh from Infosys, who's gonna to talk to you a bit about some of the very interesting stuff they're doing, as well as some interesting things that some of his customers are doing as well. Please welcome Dinesh. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you very much, Clay. Um, it was a very interesting presentation as well as including a lot of features, and we are all very excited to look forward to what OCI has to offer to all of us. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Dinesh Rao. I'm the Global Head of Enterprise Application Services at, at Infosys. Today, we're going to talk about our OCI credentials as well as what we've done in, 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 in the journey. See, if you really look at most of our customer base today um, are really going through an imperative of the entire digital transformation. This digital transformation is actually driving a business outcomes towards moving organization, becoming more agile and more nimble, really looking at newer business models. 
looking at how do we declutter the entire uh, the business landscape that we have built, try and reduce the operational expenses so that the financial capital can be used at embracing newer technology, try and reduce the, the I, I, IT structure, if, if you will. In some sense, trying to, to lead the organizations towards moving more towards being more connected and alive enterprises so that they could self-feel as well as react to what happens around in the market. And we believe, when we really look at what OCI has to offer to us, is really a core, core and a key enabling platform for us to really help us enable this journey for a lot of our customers that we really look forward to. So having said this today, what we're going to do is, broadly we're going to talk about our practice, our key insights, our learning, and as well as have one of our customers come and talk to us as to what it meant for them to really take a journey with along with us. Right? So at Infosys, you know, we have been at with Oracle for over 20 years now. We've uh, worked across the entire large spectrum of Oracle from one end of the spectrum to the business consulting on the Oracle Labs to the other spectrum of doing technology as well as database. We've also been partner of choice in terms of doing a lot of business transformation programs across all, most of the industry segments and have a, a very varied experience along with that. But what this brings to the table is the 20 years of our hard-earned credibility in knowing what Oracle applications do, what their technology footprint is, and what it takes for us to really help a very seamless migration journey towards the OCI. Right? So in addition to that, what I believe, there are three to four things one needs to really worry about from our experience in terms of really taking through this journey. Number one, every instance of the migration is very unique, has its own nuances. Now here is where we, along with the Oracle, come together to bring in our complementary strengths, to make sure that we put together a very optimized solution architecture, a very clearly laid out migration strategy so that the migration into the OCI would be very seamless and then you would really meet time to the market that you promised. Currently, we have over 30 plus engagements in flight. We have a lot of learnings from these engagements. What we have done is we have invested in building accelerators, tools, as well as a lot of aspects of AI into making sure that the assurance parts are actually automated as well. This helps bring down the total cost of ownership by over 30 to 35%, and most importantly, meet the, the timelines that we normally agree to. That was the second one. The third element that we need to really look at is we were, and we are, we were the first MSP partner with Oracle. What this brings to the table is a very unique joint partnership for us to make sure that we bring in, bundle all the licenses, your hardware costs, as, as well as services, and help you create newer com commercial constructs in the way you want to really embark on this OCI journey, which is quite important. And I see a lot of customers asking as to, would it be a CapEx, would it be an OpEx, would I need to really spend more money, and et cetera. And I think here, there would be a very unique commercial construct for you to really look at how do you really embark on this journey. Last but not the least to me is the human capital. We've invested a lot in terms of really building new talent, in terms of certifying more people on the OCI platform, as well as on the Oracle. And then hence, this human capital, along with all the other three aspects that I talked about, would help you to really get through a seamless OCI uh, migration. Now, with these four in mind, as well as a lot of experience that we have across the industry segments, we've had quite a few successes in the recent past in terms of doing uh, a very successful migration as well. So at this time, I would like to invite over one of our esteemed customer, Mangesh Theo who is the head of corporate systems at our customer, Tia, over onto the stage to just share some of his thoughts and words about how this whole journey went about. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. So as soon as I climbed the stage, I guess it made it evident that I come from financial services from the East Coast, buttoned up after seeing Diego and seeing Gaurav walk on. I think I made it very clear. I come from financial services, East Coast, 100-year-old company. Uh, so, but nonetheless, we do make investments in innovations. We do put in technology. We still make sure the lives of people are made more easier. So I have to thank uh, Oracle for all the help we had had for making this journey to the cloud, for moved our corporate accounting systems into the cloud, which in a financial services industry to do a step of this kind is quite bold, especially knowing security is always a concern. So, uh, you know, one of the good fun facts is 
from concept to contract to cloud was about a 16-month journey. Two-thirds was consumed by contract. Uh, that's, that's how the <laughs> lawyers took most of the money. We technologists, we just managed to get things in the cloud. So um, I know we'll have to uh, talk about the solution we put in place. Um, yeah. So uh, you, you went through a very successful journey of financial transformation very recently. Would you share some thoughts on <clears throat> how, how, why, why did you, in fact, even start off on this journey of trans transformation? So like I said, although we are a 100-year-old company, we still like technology, we like innovation. So one of the two, couple of big uh, and very important things, like one is scalability. Uh, it's, life is full of acquisitions now. So as you acquire companies, you want to make sure they're integrated. You want to make sure your solutions are scalable. The second thing is reliability, right? So on-prem, you have not much to s s fall back on unless you have a huge HA and everything else where you spend a lot of money. So that's the other piece, which is making sure that we are on reliability. Security was another thing, you know, OS, database, look for all vulnerabilities, patch them as often as you need to, um, network security, all of that, we could make sure that becomes Oracle's headache. So that's another aspect of thinking there. And then finally, to borrow a line from Larry yesterday, we wanted all of this and we wanted to pay less. So we certainly wanted to reduce our TCO significantly uh, as we embark this journey. So couple of the drivers that made us go there, and also the strategy, right? So organizations are looking at getting off their on-prem on and making either a private cloud or going on a public cloud. So that strategy also, we want to make sure that we don't fall back um, in that place. So that, that was sort of some of the drivers that we... Yeah, those are fantastic faced. drivers. So you having lived through this journey and then gone through this, uh, if people here in the room really want to embark on this journey, what do you think are some of your learnings and key success factors that you want to share that somebody needs to keep in mind as we really embark on such a journey? So it's all about relationships. It's, you know, it's funny that you know, I say that, but it's the relationship and the partnership with Oracle, partnership with Infosys that made us get this journey easier. A couple of things that we need to look at is, you know, it's going to cloud is not always going to be cheaper unless you do it right. That's one thing which we all have to understand. Uh, there are numerous autonomous capabilities which at the pace that they are being introduced, it's sometimes you don't, if you don't have the right people whom you're talking to, you don't really know that's available to you and you don't avail of them and you so, sort of you know, have that um, capabilities left out and you don't make the best of your room. Um, the other piece is you know, security is certainly a concern all over. So we make, made sure, you know, especially in our industry, our cyber teams are very active. They want to make sure that it's all secure. Encryption. You heard uh, Clay talk about KMS. I think that's a very important aspect for us. We want to make sure that, and it's funny, our, I mean, the Infosys guys actually had a hard time getting through our cyber guys, because they wanted a payload to be encrypted at the point of where it leaves the on-prem, had to be encrypted all through. The tunnels had to be encrypted. Finally, of course, on the Oracle's OCI side, we had object storage as well as the databases fully encrypted, so that was not an issue. So these are some things which I think in the whole thing about a big journey to cloud, we kind of sort of not pay attention at, and I think that's some things which we did a good job in making sure that we reached those outcomes. Yeah. And of course, we paid less. <laughs> so thank you so much for those insights. Thank you. It was a wonderful partnership in really driving towards this very seamless. Thank you, thank you for all thank that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. So at this stage, I want to um, welcome Metu Rao, uh, who is a principal cloud architect with Infosys for over 20 years. He's going to share with, share with you folks on what our OCA journey has been, what are our key capabilities that we have built, tools and accelerators, and, and then what we've invested towards easing this journey. Thank you. Over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So at Infosys, uh, not only you know we offer migrating the applications onto Oracle Cloud, but you know what you see today, the business drivers for reducing the run cost, you know, running your applications and reducing the cost. So primarily the cost that is involved is your software licenses, the infrastructure hosting. You know, these are the most expensive items, you know, for your run services. So what we do is, you know, we have an offerings from Infosys side to you know reduce your run cost, comprising of optimizing your application and database licenses. Like, let me just quote you an example how we were able to optimize for one of a leading bank. They were actually paying like $125 million in terms of 
the application and the database licenses, and when we got on and we optimized it, uh, this was per annum. You know, today they pay $75 million, so you could see the amount of savings that we were able to bring in with this particular service. And apart from that, we offer innovative bundling services. So we bundle the software in such a way that you know, we integrate the AMS, the application licenses, and the hosting services together. So that way, you know, we could reduce the cost uh, for the customers. And then we help you to migrate your applications to Oracle Cloud infrastructure, migrate your workloads. The beauty about you know, migrating these uh, workloads to OCI is very transparent to business. Business would not have any problem because this is, we're trying to do a lift and shift of these applications, whether it's an EBS, PeopleSoft, OBIE, JD Edwards, or you name it, all the enterprise applications, we do it lift and shift. Uh, no impact to the business, but then you're going to save your cost. You know, that's a beauty about it. Like, we give a committed saving to the tune of 30 to 40% to our customers. And then, added to it, we are modernizing the applications. So what happens is, you know, we were able to do you know, <clears throat> high performance, migrating to OCI, then your cloning is going to be faster, your response time is going to be very faster, your bad jobs are going to run much, much faster. I'm actually going to take you to a couple of slides where we capture the metrics, comparing you know, the workloads running on-premises, and the moment we have migrated to OCI without doing any business transformation, just it runs like a charm. You know, I'm going to show you in subsequent slides. Well, so now you could actually look at this, you know, the capabilities that we have built. When we try to compare your on-premises workload versus when I've migrated the, to OCI, so since we have built a lot of accelerators, tooling, so that, you know, the value that we have built, you know, uh, you know if you compare to your, you know, left-hand side where you're on-premises, where you have a huge facilities, like for your, uh, your data center cost and stuff like that, your hardware, and then your software cost, uh, then, you know, patching, everything is automated. You know, with the accelerators that have been created by Infosys in coordination with Oracle, there's a lot of value that we are creating. You know, you could see that value that we have done and see the overall operating cost, how it were able to substantially reduce. And as you see, when these workloads get migrated to OCI, we bring in a lot of scalability, agility, license optimization, very important thing, reduce the IT cost, uh, fewer skill sets that are required because of the tune of automation that we have brought in on OCI. Well, so if you look at this, you know, this is the real-time metrics that we have run from a pretty large manufacturing customer where we have migrated their large EBS workload, EBS, ACP workload, and we are trying to compare the metrics, you know, for this specific business process, a PO extract process, you know, that we just ran on-premises. The same workload that has been run on OCI after migration, we could see to the tune of 35%, you know, in the performance improvement. Nothing has been done from all we did is just migrated the workload onto OCI, uh, and then you know, very successfully, you know, you could see the metrics out of it. And comparing the similar, uh, the hardware on the on-premises onto OCI. So that's the magic OCI is doing today. This is a very interesting slide. You know, I mean, you got to take a look at this. Uh, you know. So what happens is total cost of ownership. OCI is giving you the, you know, the savings in terms of like if I try to run a same database workload on an OCI compared to other leading cloud providers, I could save 50% upfront running a database. The reason is there's a core factor. The core factor of OCI is 0.04. And the core factor of other leading cloud providers is one. So what it means is, for the same workload, if I have to run on an OCI, straight away up front, I'm going to save 50%. So, uh, so that, that's the magic. You know, what, uh, in terms of performance, real application clusters, you know, as you guys are all aware, real application clusters is primarily meant for you know, high performance and high redundancy. The full capability, full certification is available only on Oracle Cloud infrastructure compared to any other, any other cloud, and then, you also have ExaCloud services, which is an engineered system, only available in order to run an enterprise-grade application. Today, what, you, what is available is only OCI. You cannot run a rack on competitor or the leading cloud providers out there. Another important factor, we have actually taken and done a stress test of uh, you know, OLTP transaction. Uh, we took a similar VM size of uh, 
OCI and then a leading provider. And we used an Oracle stress testing slop tool. We ran a similar transaction and what we found is like OCI is close to 88 times you know, faster you know, in terms of running a database workloads. You know, that, you know, one of the reasons, you know, like multiple reasons. Now one reason is like the fully certification of like in-memory capabilities and the way you know, the, the, the storage runs, it's almost you know, eight times uh, it's faster to run a database. And then the latency is five times you know, lesser and then the network you know, highly performance oriented, very consistent network performance. So that's another advantage, you know, what we were able to notice. Uh, so what it means is total cost of ownership is cheaper, and in terms of performance, you know, it's great. You know, thumbs up, you know, when you try to migrate your workloads onto OCI. You know, this is, uh, you know, some of our findings based on, you know, almost like we have done like 30 plus customers that are already live, you know, on OCI from, from Infosys, uh, moving on to EBS workload, CBL workload, OBIE workload. Uh, you name it, you know, we were done it in a length and breadth of all the applications, and you know, we, th these are some of the metrics that we were able to capture real time, uh, you know, migrating to OCI. Uh, I would like to actually talk about some of our, you know, the key studies that we have done. You know, so the key study what you are seeing here is from, a, from one of our leading manufacturing customer, you know. Uh, very, you know, uh, more than a $10 billion turnover company, uh, Fortune 500, and, you know, uh, they are in specialized in motor manufacturing. What we did is we migrated their EBS landscape. 16 weeks end-to-end, -end, we were able to migrate them. This was one of the largest migration that we did two years back. These guys are live on OCI for past two years. EBS, a six terabyte, ASCP, 12 terabyte, Discoverer about 20 terabyte, you know, and then some of the non-Oracle workloads that we were able to migrate. And end to end, you know, we did an assessment, we did an infrastructure mapping, uh, we migrated their all non-production environments, we migrated their production environment, we migrated their disasters, setting up, uh, you know, in, in Ashburn and then the Phoenix data centers, provided the redundancy and they had an extra cloud service. And, and some of the metrics which I've shown you in the previous slide are actually from this specific client here. They're very happy and they've decided like, you know, migrate the entire workload onto OCI and they want to actually uh, hive off their data center, you know, that they have currently. So this is a you know, highly capable, uh, you know, and the metrics what you see in terms of performance, 20 to 25% reduction in the CPU, uh, then, you know, a lot of critical jobs, the long running jobs, you know, they were able to successfully run on premise, you know, migrated to OCI. 30 to 35 percent, you know, efficient uh, migrating these workloads. So this is about, you know, one of our very successful customer where we have done a large migration onto Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. This is our architecture, you know, where we migrated them to, you know, Exa Cloud Service. You know, they have an EBS, AACP, you know, just to showcase the entire landscape. You know, how we looked. Uh, when it is on OCI, uh, you know, in terms of a storage, in terms of you know the VMs, you know, the XCloud service, uh, and then the integrations that we have used. This is another financial, you know, TIA where you know we work very closely with Mangesh under his leadership, and we migrated. Thank you, Mangesh. You know, I mean, choosing us, and it was a great, successful project. So we migrated to the financial application, PeopleSoft. And then it's not only the lift and shift. What we did is we might, we actually upgraded the people tools environment. Uh, we upgraded the financial pump, everything on Oracle Cloud. And then what we did is uh, we actually put their integrations. We have implemented OIC, and then the Fusion Accounting Hub was in parallel was getting implemented. So we have migrated the financial people soft OIC, all the integrations on premises onto the SaaS. Uh, successfully put this OIC. And then you know, uh, communicating with PeopleSoft, all the internal and external interfaces. Uh, and then, the beauty about this is, you know, they are a financial organization. And what they said is, you know what, uh, we don't want you to, you know, we, we don't want to have any dependency with our IT organization. Can you run this as a SaaS? You know, today, you know, I have a, I have a work day, I have a Salesforce, and all they do is they give me a capability of you know, browser access and some of the integrations. I don't want to mess with all the security and stuff like that. So we said yes. You know, we can we can we can work with you guys. And then you know, if you see here, 
we have executed this whole of this migration as a SaaS-like management on OCI. What it means is Infosys, we do an end-to-end, you know, turnkey solution. You know, what, what we did is we, we take care of, you know, the WAF vulnerability management. We, we do the penetration testing, patch management, uh, endpoint security, AM resources, uh, logging, monitoring. Everything is controlled by Infosys as a managed services. We do the administration of the application. We manage their OS. We manage their databases. We manage their vulnerability. We manage their intrusion detection. And then, you know, we work if there's any alerts, you know, we, we let them know so that, you know, uh, and we give them the access for, you know, some kind of a monitoring, whatever they need it. And this uh, is going very, very successfully. Web application firewall is in place. Uh, you know, we have an MFA, you know, and there's a very stringent norms, you know, like Mangesh has said, you know. We have to pass through that, and you know we have to make them. You know, uh, we, we have to put them in a very good humor. Uh, so that's what it is. So over to Clay. Thank you, Clay. Thank you very much. So. I really appreciate all of you coming. We have a lot of exciting announcements. We'll be back here next year, and that's where you can see if I'm actually was lying, what we were going to do all this stuff. What I can tell you is that uh, we're not. Uh, you know, sign up for the cloud. It's really, really easy. I did it myself yesterday for a new account. Sign up. Try this stuff out. I think you'll be really impressed. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>